Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marwa. Um, I work in Microsoft Teams, uh, specifically in real-time communication, uh, real communication infrastructure team. Um, today, I'm happy to walk you through our journey to uh, .NET Core migration and how, and how that helped our services um, improve the performance, improve the cost. So I'd like to um, talk to you about the reasons why we moved to .NET Core, what services in Microsoft Teams uh, were successfully migrated to .NET Core, uh, the results that we, uh, we observed, the approach we took during the migration and the key learnings and challenges we hit, um, and what's coming next um, after the migration. So let's start with why we actually wanted to move to .NET Core. Um, uh, the first one and the most important one was the uh, performance and cost efficiency improvements that we heard of. Uh, basically, the optimized uh, implementation of the low-level classes um, that uh, .NET Core offers uh, was the major uh, incentive, like why we wanted to, uh, to actually adopt it. Um, the second one was the cross-platform support. Um, we, uh, we are actually trying to run our services on Linux. Uh, currently, they run on Windows, and it would be great if we can run them on Linux as well because of all the containerization uh, performance improvements um, uh, with running containers on Linux. Um, the third one would be the ability to host on Kestrel and Docker. Uh, so Kestrel is supported by .NET Core, and uh, Kestrel is actually um, uh, is a cross-platform as well, and it's a better uh, request. It has a better request pro uh, uh, processing performance. Um, and uh, next would be the support for the latest transports like HTTP3 Quick. Um, so we are in the communication business and uh, making sure that our transports are reliable and uh, be able to. Uh, offer better experience to the users is actually the number one priority for our team. Um, so HTTP 3, it's the, the same as HTTP 2.1.1, like the same semantics, uh, same uh, request methods and everything, status codes and everything. Um, the only difference is in the uh, uh, transport layer. Uh, it uses TS, uh, TCP, um, uh, HTTP 1 and 2 uses TCP versus uh, uh, HTTP 3, which uses Quick. Um, so how does that help? It actually have a better experience um, during uh, connection packet loss, um, the faster responses for the first request. Um, it also um, have um, um, better actually support for the transitioning between networks. Um, the second, like the, the next one would be the testability. Um, so um, uh, with the use of test server, um, uh, we were actually, we wanted to use uh, uh, to see how we can use it to fit our inf infrastructure testing infrastructure, um, and actually this turned out to be great. Uh, it was the integration was seamless and um, things worked uh, like without any issues or problems. Um, the built-in dependency injection, and I'll talk about this one later in the key learnings and challenges. We had some issues, um, and we will uh, walk through like how we uh, overcame those. Those. So let's see what's next. So. What actually, how many services are, did we migrate on .NET Core? And um, what are these services, basically? So I'll be talking about the IC3 services or the Intelligent um, communicate, Conversation and Communication Cloud services. Uh, this is mainly the, like, the backend services of Microsoft Teams. Um, so we had 122 services planned uh, for the .NET Core migration. Um, we successfully migrated 37 uh, services in the past two years. Uh, we are we have 30 ser services in progress right now. So this is almost like 30% of our services were migrated to .NET Core. Um, I'll actually deep dive into two of the main like two of the services that we migrated and start sharing the results of those two services. The first one will be the broker service. Um, so the broker service is one of the transports we use uh, to send notifications from server to client. Uh, it's based on a PubSub model, and um, uh, the broker on, it, on its own actually processes around 63 billion requests a day. Um, so you can actually uh, have an idea like how critical <laughs> like um, improving the performance and uh, the cost of running the service is, and um, uh, as well as like trying to avoid regressions during the migration. Um, the second service I want to talk about will be the conversation service. Uh, this is actually the service that manages all the modalities um, for signaling. Um, so basically the modalities like audio, video, um, and um, like the lobby, uh, how actually the mid-operations inside the meeting happen, like raise hand, lower hand, 
uh, mute unmute uh, changing role uh, change uh, like these all these mid operations are so are actually uh, managed by the conversation service conversation service processes around like 600 billion requests a day so it's one of the biggest services we have um, in uh, in microsoft teams um, okay so let's move um, to the next slide so um, in the next slide i want to talk to you about the results um, uh, like uh, we, we observed after the migration. For broker service, um, as soon as we started the migration, we were able to um, uh, to narrow down, like to, to lower down our cost by 50%. Uh, so it was 50% reduction in the total cores that we used to run our service. And like, as you can see from the chart, like we started with um, like 27K cores uh, before the migration. And then in four months, we were able to uh, gradually um, uh, reclaim the cores until it was 13k so it's basically above like 50 percent uh, of the total reduction um, there was also 60 percent reduction in the api latencies i'm not sure if the graph is um, is actually clear but it's uh, we went down from like 16 milliseconds to 5 milliseconds which is a huge improvement um, on a on a service that actually as a transport service this was uh, this was really um, great to see um, we were able to save around half a million dollars uh, annually, um, so that's uh, that's also a good uh, good uh, cost uh, the, uh, improvement uh, that we observed. Um, conversation service results were very interesting as well. Uh, we were able to see a reduction in like improvements in the CPU by uh, around twenty five to thirty five percent. Um, this was huge. Um, and then uh, for the joint meeting latencies, like when you join a meeting, we were able to observe 20 to 30 percent uh, uh, latency improvements. Uh, actually, we went from like 90 milliseconds to uh, 50 milliseconds. Um, and we were able to save around like uh, 1.25 million dollars um, uh, annually, um, which is a huge uh, saving as well. Um, the improvements actually, the results didn't stop at that. Like we, uh, we actually uh, for the large meetings, um, we we also like we had some we we were actually trying to uh, investigate bottlenecks uh, with uh, large meetings and uh, uh, people like joining. Like when you start a meeting, like we we see like thousands of requests, uh, join requests, trying to get into the meeting, and this was actually causing some bot bottlenecks. So with the .NET Core migration, we saw an impressive results um, in terms for like for the large meetings. Uh, we were able to see 40 to 50, 56 percent CPU improvements um, uh, for for like 1,000 uh, 1, participants meetings. Um, we were also um, we were also able to observe like 40 to 80 percent uh, join and create conversation latency improvements. This was huge. Um, so you can see from the tables uh, I shared. Um, for the for the best case scenario, like um, well, like because you you had to repeat like to take like various samples. So the best case scenario, the CPU max of average was uh, eighteen percent compared to forty one percent on Net Framework. Uh, the max of max uh, CPU was uh, sixty five percent on .NET Core compared to ninety two percent in uh, .NET Framework. Latency was uh, two point five seconds compared to sixteen seconds, and of course the conversation size was was one uh, k. Uh, 1,000 participants. Um, on the worst case scenario, uh, CPU was 48.5% compared to 80% on Net Framework, um, and the latency was 11 seconds compared to 18.4 seconds. Um, and of course, the conversation size was still 1,000 participants. Um, so what does that mean? Um, actually, that means uh, better reliability during the large meetings and better experience for the customers uh, during meeting joins and the mid-meeting -oper mid uh, operations and activities. Um, so that was uh, great to see as well. So next, I'll uh, walk you through the migration phases. Um, we actually, the migration of these services, it did not happen in a month, <laughs> I would say. Like, uh, for example, Broker took uh, six months um, because it was our first service to migrate. Uh, we had some challenges and some key learnings. Um, uh, conversation service, for example, took 10 months, um, roughly 10 months. Um, so it was not an e like I wouldn't say like it's a it's a replace find and replace. Uh, it's actually it required some thoughts, and we actually um, took the opportunity while actually migrating to .NET Core to fix other stuff as well, like uh, tackle other performance uh, bottlenecks that we've seen in .NET Framework and try to improve them in .NET Core. Um, so the migration phases uh, it was actually 
um, I will divide it into three phases. Um, the first one is the preparation phase. Basically, you're trying to prepare your repo or you know, like the project for .NET Core migration. Um, this is converting the projects to SDK style, uh, multi-targeting the projects so that they can build on both .NET Framework and .NET Core, um, and analyzing the dependencies, make sure there are no blockers. If there are any blockers, uh, try to migrate these blockers first, or reach out to external teams, try to uh, ask for the .NET Core support for their libraries. Um, we also made changes to the pipeline to make sure that um, whatever we check in for .NET Core does not break. Um, and uh, 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 actually, these steps were very important to just uh, set up uh, for our uh, project to, 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 that, to make the execution and validation a lot easier after that. Um, for the, the execution uh, part, we uh, this actually migrating the middlewares and controllers, removing the service point manager, which is not supporting .NET Core, and uh, replacing the sockets HTTP handler. Uh, we made sure that um, Kestrel is adopted during the migration as well because of the performance improvements that we uh, we were reading about so for Kestrel, and it actually it was doing great for us. Um, so we made it a requirement. It's optional, but we made it a requirement. Um, and then the migration of the authentication layer, and then at the very end we migrate the end-to-end -end tests. Like um, these services, actually, because they are not small services. Um, we had like 10, 10 k uh, test cases uh, that we needed to migrate, and the test cases actually dependent on, de was dependent on all the layers. So you needed to get all the layers completed be first before actually digging into the tests. Um, the validation and rollout phase. Um, this was actually um, the final phase. Basically, making sure that all the synthetic transactions are successful on dot, .NET Core uh, deployments, uh, we perform like we do the performance testing. Um, if there are any fine tuning that we needed to do, like for example, the GC, the garbage collection settings for .NET Core were different from .NET, .NET Framework, and this was actually revealed in the, uh, during the performance testing. Um, if there are any uh, release or pipeline changes um, that we um, um, we can. Um, uh, like we, we need to do, for example, because uh, like we have weekly releases in our services, um, and every build that goes out, it has it has to go through different stages. Uh, we start with our internal team releasing, releasing the new build store, internal team first, and then the bigger team in Microsoft Teams, and then it goes to Microsoft, and then from Microsoft it goes to production. So, so there are several changes, uh, like several stages that it goes um, that the build goes through, and in every stage you need to make sure that you get covered on .NET Core plus .NET uh, Framework. Um, so that was, uh, that was uh, these were the release pipeline changes that we needed to do. At, at that point as well, you needed to make sure that you can roll out um, uh, any time if, you've, like, uh, if you actually find any regressions in .NET Core. Um, so that was it. Uh, these were the three phases um, that we had. Um, Okay, some of the key learnings and challenges. Um, actually, I'll talk about a few um, because of uh, time uh, constraints. But we, um, um, this were, these were the important ones that we encountered during the migrations. Um, the first one is actually uh, it's interesting. So the get hash code uh, is not consistent for strings and other value types um, in .NET Core. Um, it behaves differently um, so than .NET Framework, and we used a consistent hash. Um, to actually uh, determine the index uh, of the Redis shard that the meeting will land on. So, but uh, the the thing is, like as soon as we, we started hitting the internal stages with the build, like after it was rolled out, um, we started seeing that people are joining their own meetings. Like everyone, like you have a meeting and people try to join the same meeting and then everyone ends in a separate meeting. Uh, so this was a bad bug and it actually it was not discovered in the, in the lower um, uh, stages. And the reason is in the lower stages we didn't have multiple Redis shards. Uh, so that was an interesting bug and we had to um, um, that we had to actually update our uh, our code in order to uh, make it consistent with .NET Framework. Uh, um, the Unity Service Provider and Dependency Injection, uh, we actually use um, Unity Service Provider. Um, and we con like after the, even after the .NET Core migration, we continued to use it. Um, but we found in um, 
like uh, we found that as soon as you start deploying to .NET Core and it actually runs for a couple of hours, CPU reaches 100%. And the problem is that Unity Service Provider, like it uses child, if we were using child containers and the creation of disposal, like especially like disposing of those child containers were taking like uh, were very, it was very expensive and taking most of the CPU time. So we had to come up with a hybrid approach using the built-in dependency injection in .NET Core as well as the Unity um, the service provider. Um, it's, it was, at that time, it was a workaround, but uh, our goal is to move to the built-in dependency injection 100% uh, and don't rely on uh, other like hybrid approaches. Uh, but that was interesting. Um, uh, so um, yeah, we had, to, we will actually, we'll take this work uh, later uh, to move to uh, built-in dependency injection 100%. Um, the third one was an, um, Earlier, we actually rolled out on .NET Core 3.1. And after the rollout, um, the, we actually uh, saw that it does not support the non-validated headers. Uh, and we had some customers actually uh, send us some uh, malformed um, VIA headers. Uh, they were they did not follow the correct semantics, um, but the, the syntax. Uh, but uh, we did not have any support for 3.1 to, uh, to skip the validation for those headers. So in the middle of ro the rollout, actually, we had to roll back and upgrade to .NET Core 6 um, and then um, continue, the, and then we were able to deploy and, uh, and, uh, and get around this issue. Um, the second one was the support for the delay certificate uh, for the client authentication mode. Um, our services actually need uh, the delay certificate uh, config for both anonymous endpoints and non-anonymous endpoints. Uh, we actually discovered this also during the rollout, um, and this actually required updating our common libraries also to, three, to 6 um, um, because it, they were running on 3.0. Um, so actually, the .NET Core 6 comes with uh, so many improvements over 3.1, so I highly recommend that um, like always go with the latest um, release uh, from .NET Core. Um, the, the second one I'll be mentioning is the, the HTTP request message headers. These are not thread safe in .NET Core 6. Um, we were lucky. Uh, we were only hitting it in a in a very minor like uh, code path where uh, the metrics actually it was during the met metrics logging, um, and we had to change this to synchronous codes uh, instead of uh, to avoid this race condition. Um, we were lucky; like it did not it didn't impact performance. And the other thing is. Um, we have a fix in .NET Core 7, so we are looking forward to actually move to .NET Core 7 uh, to fix that issue. Um, the other one, the built-in controller responses uh, do not return valid JSON uh, the, for errors. So we had to come up with our own custom action to actually return a valid uh, JSON. And this actually, the valid JSON was expected by the partners interacting with these services. Um, .NET Core defaults to chunked encoding. Um, chunked encoding actually was uh, in .NET framework. It had a problem. It had a bug with uh, proxy requests. Um, so most of the partners interacting with these services did, did actually disabled it. So when we shipped .NET Core, um, chunked encoding was co causing issues with those like for those partner requests. So we had to uh, work around it and, and set the content length to zero to avoid actually these um, these failures for those partners. Uh, test server, I mentioned that we used it in tests, uh, testing infrastructure, and it worked great, uh, but we also used it in production um, in one of our scenarios. Uh, we have a custom uh, UDP so like uh, support transport um, in our code, and we, needed, we actually needed an in-memory uh, server um, to, uh, to support the, UDP, the custom UDP logic Hi. that we have. Um, in .NET Framework, we used HTTP server, but we didn't find um, a close, uh, a close actually uh, component that we can use in .NET uh, Core. So we went with the test server, and it's been working fine for us until now. Um, so that was another thing. So those were the main uh, learnings and challenges uh, that we encountered. Um, other learnings and challenges, um, basically during the migration itself. Um, 
we, we wanted to build the expertise in .NET Core um, first before actually digging into the .NET Core migration. Uh, we spent two months actually just learning, uh, looking at videos um, and uh, making sure that we understand like what it takes uh, to move the .NET Core. We were able to to actually uh, do a good job there, and uh, even like now we we have like cross pollination like some between teams, like some members um, of the teams who became expert in .NET Core, trying to help other teams like work with them, like migrating their services. So it's been uh, pretty good. Um, we did not want to disrupt continuous development and features coming in. Like these features are actually very active. There are hundreds of PRs that get checked in every like check in every uh, month. So we didn't want to no, we didn't want to have any blockers. Um, so uh, we in order to do that, uh, we we needed to actually uh, support we needed to actually uh, make changes uh, like in, in the master branch and at the same time to avoid any uh, breaking changes to .NET Core. But at the same time, we needed to make sure that it does not break any of the mainstream features or um, did not block any of the other uh, service owners from making changes. So we used actually, we relied heavily on the uh, preprocessor directives um, just to make sure that could execute this one in .NET, if you're running .NET Core versus .NET Framework. Um, and that was, uh, that worked pretty well and the service owners actually and the service uh, for the, for those services were making a good job to ensure that all the new features were actually on .NET Core as well, support both .NET Framework and .NET Core. Um, uh, th there was a challenge having like multiple people work on the .NET Core migration, uh, and then at the same time they don't get blocked on each other. Like there are so many uh, parts that are dependent on each other, um, so we had to come up with a plan, um, make, like which uh, components to migrate before which components to make sure that everyone is able to productive, like is a, um, is productive and making sure that everyone is able to deliver. Uh, a gradual rollout of the .NET Core while still supporting .NET Framework. As I see, like, as I mentioned, like the, these actually services run like uh, billions of requests every day. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we roll out gradually uh, .NET Core. We support both .NET Core and .NET Framework in the same image, uh, so that we can switch back to that .NET Framework in case of any failures. Um, and um, we uh, during the rollout, we make sure that we actually um, monitoring the the metrics and everything, um, like uh, every day, like looking at the metrics, make sure that uh, no exceptions uh, occur in one component versus the other. Um, but actually, what's coming next for these services? Uh, for all the services that are migrated to the .NET Core, uh, we are looking forward to migrate them to Linux. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Linux is actually performs better with uh, containerization, uh, the process isolation and stuff like that. So uh, Linux is actually will work better in terms of reliability. Um, and we, in fact, we actually we successfully migrated uh, the broker service, which was on .NET Core, um, and we are seeing actually great results there. Um, the other one will be the migrating to HTTP3 with Quick um, for the, all the perform like performance improvements and the reliability and experience improvements that I've talked about um, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so this is actually work in progress. Um, and then last is upgrading to .NET Core. Uh, so .NET Core, um, there is one of the videos talking about it already, but um, it actually, it has uh, the authentication improvements. Uh, we uh, actually looks great. Uh, it has fixes for some of the race conditions. Uh, it supports having different processing queues um, for short running versus long running. Um, uh, requests. So uh, actually, we're looking forward to um, to actually adopting .NET Core 7 as well. Um, that was it um, for the Microsoft Teams running on .NET Core and uh, explaining the journey. Um, I hope it uh, it's useful to uh, many of you. Thank you so much.